what I wish I would have known at the beginning was how toxic the foods I was eating really are and the fact that no one is out there safeguarding our food supply and the foods that we consider mainstream and are on the shelves aren't necessarily healthy for you or even non-dangerous. Q Music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And as always, it's my honor and pleasure to be with you on another brand new episode. We have a returning guest. I'm so excited. I talked to her clear back live and in person. We were both in San Antonio, clear back January 2020. She was originally with us on the show in August of 2018. Yeah, we've been on the air a long time. We're in our seventh year here. And when we chatted down in San Antonio, we both said about, I got to have you back on the show. And then of course, you know, wow, (laughs) 2020 was what it was, right? Just so many things intervened, but she is back with us for uh, this episode to catch up. I have been following her some of her protocols, I won't say all of them, but the, a lot of her protocols since to meeting her in 2018 and feeling great. And so let me introduce her again, because her name is Elizabeth Yarnell. And since being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis at the age of 30, she has spent the past 20 years studying to how to manage autoimmunity naturally as, as a traditional naturopath. She's worked with hundreds of MS and other autoimmune sufferers. Um, you know, I like to say thrivers. <laughs> they, maybe they come in as sufferers and leave as thrivers. How's that? At her nationwide clinic using unique personalized natural therapies to help them slow or even reverse the course of their disease and their diagnosis. And her latest venture is the Holistic Health and Wellness Collective. We'll talk about that. It's an online hub for seekers of natural methods of health and well-being to to find out about different modalities. Have you ever been curious about a certain modality? You can go there and go, huh, I didn't know that. Maybe I'll give it a try. As any of you know about my show, not only do I interview a lot of people with a lot of modalities, I give most of them a try. (laughs) I won't say 100%, but I've given most of them a try. And I think that's one reason that I continue to thrive, uh, even with this diagnosis, you know, it's really no longer an issue for me. It it really isn't. I mean, yes, the diagnosis is there. Yes, they go, oh, Sharon, you're in remission. We don't use the word cured in air quotes. I'm like, great, that's fine. But I feel good. So that's the important thing is how do you feel? How's your life going for you? And so we're going to talk to Elizabeth about that, as well as some of her protocols and just this idea of how to continue to optimize every day. I first want to jump in and talk to her about one of the protocols I followed with her right away. And I want to talk about food sensitivity. She's known for that. She's written cookbooks about that and has on her website. Oh, just tons of recipes about food sensitivities. So without further ado, welcome back to the show, Elizabeth. Oh, Sharon, I'm so excited to chat with you again today. It's so fun to be back. I can't believe it was 2018. That's really shocking to me. I know. Shocking to me too. I had to go look it up because it didn't seem that long ago. <laughs> and then of course, a mutual friend it actually said, do you know Elizabeth? And I said, of course I know Elizabeth. <laughs> Recently, and it brought back to my mind that we talked clear back in January 2020 when we were together in person down in Texas. 
Oh my goodness. One of the things I do want to just talk about first, and then we'll get into this amazing holistic health and wellness collective. I think it's an awesome idea because you're part of my team and it takes a whole team to raise a healthy person. So <laughs> that's my view. And so I was so thrilled you're doing that. But I want to talk a little bit first about one of the big things for me with my work with you was uncovering food sensitivities. And I want to tell a quick story. One of the things that I found out I was sensitive to, guys, you'll never believe this because I went, seriously? <laughs> and once I got a lot of the inflammation out of my system and I was able to get my inflammation way down, I was accidentally exposed to this dreaded <laughs> well-known thing. And I called Elizabeth up and I said, oh my gosh, I cannot believe like this little minuscule piece of, believe it or not, parsley sat me over the edge into inflammation. Now, not everybody, don't give up parsley. Parsley is not a bad <laughs> thing, okay? Please, please get food sensitivities to find out, do you have a trigger? For me, it one of them was, of all things, parsley. Now, like I said, I'm not bad mouthing parsley here. It's a great herb, great thing for most people. But let's talk about the need for knowing that because like if I called her and I'm like, oh, I cannot believe that I just got all this inflammation again. Yeah. I mean, what could seem more innocuous than parsley, right? I know. <laughs> Who would have guessed? <laughs> I mean, I could think of all the big names, you know, I mean, all the big words out there that people throw around all the time and like, okay, but parsley, I was like, huh. parsley. And you would never have known that without the food sensitivity testing. And the truth is, is that especially those of us who've already tipped over into autoimmunity, we walk around when we're in that state, we walk around probably at 70, 80, 90% inflamed all the time. And we don't really even notice because that's our normal. And that's why we're in that autoimmune state because we're just in this chronic state of inflammation. But honestly, you might not even be able to identify that inflammation. But then when we go through the dietary therapy and we remove all the inflammation very systematically and scientifically, and we come down to like, oh, what, 10, 20% inflammation as a, as a normal, and then you eat something that's on your hyperreactive list, like parsley, and then you shoot up to 90%, now you notice. Oh boy, Before did you I you never would have noticed, right? <laughs> that, that's exactly what you told me. It says, well, that's a good sign. I'm like, oh my gosh, how could that be a good sign? It's a and good you, sign because it yeah. means that you successfully removed so much of that everyday inflammation that was masking everything that was going on, that what was the triggers were causing it. And as you know, it takes a lot of effort to get down to that place where you're less inflamed, uninflamed enough to be able to really notice those triggers. And it is a really good sign when that happens, even though it's not fun. No, and it dissipated <laughs> fairly quickly uh, because my body wasn't in that hyper state of the huge percentages anymore. So it did dissipate pretty quickly. I want to say about the worst of it, probably 48 hours and, you know, wash, getting it out of my system. But well, and the important thing was we were able to identify the culprit so that you yes. can continue to have parsley over and over and over. Oh, I'm just going to have some parsley because with no idea that it was parsley that was causing your problems. Oh, absolutely. And like I said, I'm not bad mouth and parsley just for me. So you guys, you got to have, you got to find out the sensitivities that are specific to you. It's sort of like I was talking to uh, another expert in autoimmunity and we were talking about how the diagnosis isn't always the diagnosis. I mean, it's sort of a container word because so many people have uh, different diagnosis just manifest in different ways. There's some telltale signs, but, and I think it's the same about food sensitivities, um, you know, you, you won't know until you know, uh, have scientific proof. Like, okay, this particular thing, I just need to not eat anymore. And a lot of the things that I first um, gave up for a while, you know, uh, every, the, I love the test. It's so easy. It comes green, yellow, red. <laughs> so, I mean, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty easy, right? Eat the, eat the things that are in the go category and 
careful in the caution category and stay away from the red category. So it's pretty simple. And uh, for me, not too many things were in the red category. So that was great too. I, I didn't feel like I was starving, giving up parsley. You just have to be more cautious, especially right. when you eat out. But in, in things like parsley, almost impossible to figure out. So let's say you go out to dinner, let's say an Italian restaurant, and you have, we'll just even say like spaghetti and meatballs. And then the next day you feel bad and you're trying to figure out, well, what is it that I ate? Well, let's see. In the spaghetti, there's the wheat um, from the, in the spaghetti. And then in the um, meatballs, there's maybe beef and there's might be veal in there and there might be breadcrumbs in there and there might be um, five or six different spices. Maybe there's oregano and marjoram and, and basil and garlic. And then, then we have the sauce and then now we have tomatoes and we have um, uh, carrots maybe or what all the different things, celery that are in the sauce. So we've got now a list of like 30 different potential culprits. It's almost impossible to figure out what your sensitivities are with that many variables. So this food sensitivity testing that I do, which is um, based on the MRT, the mediator release test, which is really the gold standard of food sensitivity testing, and then is followed by LEAP dietary therapy, which is a system, a system that I didn't develop, but was scientifically developed as an oligoantigenic dietary therapy. And going through that, that's how we get to the point where we can drill down and really see how parsley might affect you. <laughs> right. Or who knows, yours could be pumpkin. I mean, I don't or know. Like what... Mine is lettuce, right? Lettuce, lettuce. I mean, what lettuce. could be more innocuous than everywhere in the world at every right. restaurant? And than what lettuce? do you do when you're trying to be more healthy? You eat salads. Yeah. It's, it's amazing to me how, how it worked. But, and so Let's talk a little bit about how we do it. We throw around some big ideas here, but one of the things about the test was really pretty simple. I mean, I, I sent in some different lab work and back came this amazing list of things. Like I said, it came back green, you're okay. Yellow, be cautious, you can have some. And red, stay away from. And like I said, the red luckily was not too many and a couple of them I like, well, I don't even like that, so I'm not gonna miss it. <laughs> <laughs> for me it's become a become a, a lifestyle now I've memorized all the ones that are that's the goal yeah and so it's really become a lifestyle I think the hard part for me was sometimes not all the times but so, a couple of times a week for the family it becomes two meals they're like but I want I'm like okay yes yes um it depending on what that what the person's living situation is I try to to encourage them in advance to get their family on board. Like, well, if you can just have your family agree to eat the things that you're gonna eat because it's not an elimination diet that I take my clients through, it is a restricted diet. So we go through and it's less that, oh, we're gonna avoid the things that turned up high in the red zone, A, B, and C, and, and then I'm gonna send you off. That's not exactly how it happens. We go through, we cross-correlate botanical food families. We identify the least inflammatory foods for that person. And it's very individualized, very customized, all based on your blood. And so we say, okay, X, Y, and Z are the least inflammatory foods. We're gonna create and design a restricted diet based on these least inflammatory foods. And that will help move the inflammation out of your body as quickly as possible. So the first two weeks, you might not even remember back in 2018, were the most restrictive. And then beyond that, we steadily opened up and increased the amount of foods that we found to be safe in a way that we minimized the variables so that we could more easily identify any culprits. I don't, I'm not sure I like the word restrictive. I didn't think it was all that restrictive. I've had restrictive oh, diets before. <laughs> I've had restrictive diets before, like the, there were certain other protocols I did where I'm like, yeah, no, this is way too restrictive. Well, I mean, yeah. In my memory, I think that actually this diet increased the amount of foods that you were allowing yourself yes. at the time. Yeah. You had been did. more restricted unnecessarily as it turned out. 
Right. Exactly. I was like, oh, so to me, it was like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> I can have that again. All these to- things that you had been denying yourself just because you were trying to figure it out on your own that you now found to be safe. Right, right. I've been following some other dietary protocols and, and they're they're fine. But I was just like, okay, this is getting old and this cannot be healthy for the long term. And that's what I was looking for, something that continues to add. I do have a curiosity question now that it's been since 18. Does it change over time? I mean, I mean, not that I really want to taste some of those red zone foods to find out because <laughs> I, I don't want to activate inflammation. Does your body sensitivities change if you don't have it for a while? So it does. The more that you can completely avoid and eliminate something, the um, more likely that your body might be able to acclimate and accept it again. Some things will come back and some things will never come back. So I, for instance, just retested. I often find I retest people after like six or seven years. And so I just personally retested and found some of the things that were on my original test have resolved themselves like mushrooms. I are no longer in my, in my danger zone. And some things are the same. They're still really high and other things became higher during the seven years. So it definitely can change. I think the thing for me, besides the test, and that's, I mean, it's fascinating, but for me, as I go through the daily eating patterns, I do notice, and I do think back all of a sudden you'll wake up and you're, oh man, I'm feeling a little more inflamed than I'm normally feeling. And so then sometimes I go back and think, okay, what is it that I ate? And for me, sometimes it's, I'm not always sure, but sometimes I would say that what I ate may have been fine, but maybe it wasn't as I'm going to say the word clean as I had thought it was, like maybe it had been exposed to something, even though you wash or whatever, because one time I had a bad reaction to an apple and it was an organic apple as far as I knew, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, I've never had a reaction to an apple before or since, and they are on my green list. So, so I, I found that interesting too. Like, okay, well, just don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because you have this one time going, hmm, my inflammation is really high this time. Well, let's talk about what that might look like. So a lot of people don't self-identify that they're inflamed. So we know that if you are diagnosed with an autoimmune issue, that that by definition means chronic inflammation. But beyond that, we have to remember, well, inflammation in the head could be a headache or a migraine or foggy brain or irritableness or moodiness. We think about like when you have PMS and all of those emotions are so up to the surface, that's all inflammation, the bloating. So inflammation in the sinuses might be a runny or stuffy nose or chronic sinus infections. Inflammation in the chest might be asthma or um, high blood pressure or heart issues. Inflammation in the gut might be bloating or acid reflux or heartburn or um, other digestive issues. Inflammation in the bowels might be constipation or diarrhea or um, other dysfunctional bowel things, a lot of gas, inflammation in the joints might be fibromyalgia, might be arthritis. So just like what you were saying earlier, a diagnosis is only a name. That a diagnosis is just a way to name something. So like if I say as a doctor, you have appendicitis, well, that means you have inflammation. Anything says itis is inflammation, inflammation of the appendix. Well, that's great. Now, you know, your appendix is inflamed, but you don't know why it's inflamed or how to solve it. So a diagnosis is really, really limited. It's really just a naming function. I believe the diagnosis is irrelevant. If you have inflammation, that's what we need to adjust. It doesn't matter if you've been diagnosed with whatever. If you've been, it all, it's all the same. It's, if there's inflammation, we can address that. Well, for me, it's really come down to so many of parts of autoimmune. When I talk to people, inflammation seems to be one of the underlying things that that uh, that we all have in common. I mean, it may show up in different ways, but it does. Every time I 
stay in that range of the low inflammation, I'm like, yeah, I'm, we're doing, feeling really great today. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. to me, that is one of those, uh, as you go along in your diagnosis and you get to learn to your body more, how you react to things and all of that, you're like, okay. And I do want to point out, and I want you to speak to it a little bit, Elizabeth, is that food isn't the only thing that causes inflammation. To me, I think, you know, I get an emotional shock. I might feel a little more in some of the inflammation sim symptoms and gosh, 2020, none of us had any of that, of course, right? <laughs> <laughs> no trauma going on in our lives. <laughs> So I think that it's in some way, it's a chicken and an egg. Like, I don't think that physical problems manifest directly from, say, anxiety, but I think anxiety can manifest from physical problems. And I think that oftentimes things like anxiety or panic attacks or even depression are actually chemical reactions that are going on from that inflammatory process that's going on in your body. Oh, so I had a little backwards. Okay. Chicken and egg. That's for sure. You know, I can see very clearly my son, who was really my guinea pig for all of this going through his growing up years, um, I could see very clearly when his behavior issues would rear up, well, I could track it down to what he ate. And maybe it was eight hours after he ate it. Maybe it was three days after he ate it because food sensitivities can be delayed by up to four days. So there's really a lot of correlation, but it's hard to hard to track by yourself. Oh, especially if you're saying four days. It's like, what did I, I mean, I have a hard enough time remembering four what days. I ate for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And then you think about all those variables, those 30 ingredients that might've been in that spaghetti dinner. And that was just one meal. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, we need to take a quick commercial break. And when we come back, we're going to talk to Elizabeth some more about, well, we'll find out where it goes. Who knows? I will find out but we'll <laughs> join us back in two minutes. Life Interrupted Radio will return after these messages from our sponsors. It's great sponsors like these that keep this show coming to you every week. Be sure and stop by lifeinterruptedradio.com to learn more. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Listen and imagine. It takes five seconds to send a text, and for those five seconds, you're driving blind. Life is worth more than a text. Stay alive. Don't text and drive. Visit StopTextStopRex.org, a message brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Project Yellow Light, Noise, and the Ad Council. Hi, this is Sharon, and of course you know me from here on the Autoimmune Hour. Maybe you don't know I'm also an author. My latest book is for kids. It's Pinky Chenille and the Rainbow Hunters, a winner of a five-star reader's favorite review. It's perfect for your early reader and a great bedtime story for your young adventurers. Check it out over at PinkyChenille.com. That's P-I-N-K-Y-C-H-E-N-I-L-L-E.com. See you there. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And tonight we're here with Elizabeth Yarnell. And she, we've been chatting about food sensitivities and 
all sorts of things about how to manage our autoimmunity naturally, as she is a traditional naturopath. We've been talking about food sensitivities and how to eat and what to eat. And before we leave that, I just want you to wrap it up in a nice tiny bow that this doesn't mean you stop eating, you stop enjoying food. (laughs) Tell us the light at the end of the tunnel. No, in fact, my goal with working with clients is to encourage them to eat and enjoy, make foods that they enjoy but only of the ingredients that are safe for them. So we spend a lot of time talking about, well, how do you recreate the foods that you love, whether it's cookies or cakes, or I had one client who missed Arby's roast roast beef sandwiches. How do you recreate those foods out of the safe and clean ingredients that are good for you? Because life should be enjoyable and that includes eating. And by the way, I never tell anyone that they can't drink alcohol. We just find the right alcohol for them to drink. Oh, okay. (laughs) Well, that's good to know. As far as, you know, what I liked about it is when we worked together, especially at the beginning, was all the recipes you gave me. It was like, okay, well, you know, you can't have this, but here's a workaround. And that was helpful, as well as understanding the food groups, or I guess, uh, would it, would it be like the food families, species? the food, the food families. families. Thank you. Thank you. It really isn't the food groups the food families. I learned so much about nutrition working with you, which has helped. So the one thing that has helped a lot, my, my family sort of like, oh, okay. Didn't know that about that. Right. And we don't talk at all about macronutrients like carbohydrates or proteins or calories. I don't ever have anybody count calories. I believe that's a flawed theory. I don't think it's all a, an equation of calories in versus calories out. In fact, obesity and being overweight is now considered excessive inflammation. So it's not about your self-control or anything about you as a person. If you can't lose weight, it's about that you're just eating the wrong foods and you just don't know. Yeah. It's not even about the quantity of food that you're eating. It's the wrong foods. Yeah, the wrong foods for you. Okay. The wrong foods for you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to demonize any any of the of the really, you know, healthy foods no. that I talk Lettuce about. Lettuce might be fine for you. It's just not fine for me. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Parsley is fine for many, many, many people, but not not for me. And, right. and so don't be surprised, you know, give it a try. Don't be surprised if you find out like, wow. That is shocking. I didn't, I didn't even think about that. So I wanted to talk some more about as you um, develop these uh, things, you, you've come into this idea, and I share it because you're part of my team, that to create and optimize your health and well-being, it takes like a whole village, <laughs> <And> <laughs> which I can agree more. Now that I have stabilized those people in my village, and most of them talk to each other, not all of them, but most of them talk to each other, and all of them have complementary I would say sort of ideas uh-huh. about health and well-being. So you've developed this really cool, your, your new venture. You're always into new ventures. I just love this. <laughs> but your latest venture is a Holistic Health and Wellness Collective. And I just love this idea of a place online where I can, maybe I hear about something, whether it's on this show or another show or whatever. Like, I don't even know what, you know, what that is, like, I'll throw out a word like Reiki, I don't even know what that is. I mean, I've discovered what it is now, but I'm just throwing out that (laughs) word. Maybe, maybe I wonder if that could be of service to me. Exactly. And there's probably so many modalities that even someone as aware and informed as you has never heard of before out there. So my idea was that There's nowhere to go for people who are seeking alternatives to conventional or allopathic medical care can look and find all the different options, maybe not even all the different options, but different options that they may not have ever heard of, may not have ever encountered before, because it's kind of hit and miss. Oh, I heard about this practitioner who does Reiki, or I heard about this person who does um, sacrocranial release, or I heard about this person who does this. So my thought was there's a a missing piece where people can go to learn about all these different types of modalities and meet all these practitioners and kind of give a little try. Is this something that resonates with me? Does sound healing resonate with me? Does um, healing with lasers resonate with, with me? And then if it does, then you can get a little taste of it. And then you can certainly go dive deeper with a a uh, 
skilled practitioner and learn so much more about it. But you're right. I believe that everyone's health journey probably takes more than one type of intervention or um, healing modality to really help them achieve optimal health. Oh, absolutely. Uh, And I just want to go back, circle back around because even though I call it like alternative care, it to me, I use allopathic medicine too. I don't want to, this is not about blame and shame and, you know, pointing fingers at any sort of medical practice, but which ones work well in tandem for me? I find and, you know, found it early on that massage helped me feel better. It helped me to calm down. It's helped my lymph system somewhat, you know, just helped me feel better. And after talking with other medical professionals that were on my team, they said, yes, there's no reason you can't do massage, you know, and I'm like, okay. So that's the key thing here is explore and you find out these different things. And that's what I love about your collective. It's got a great place to explore different options is to give it a try. And always check with your other medical professionals to see how they feel about it. Maybe they know someone in your neighborhood as well. So, you know, things like that. And it's funny, you mentioned sound healing. We had Sharon Karn on the other day about using uh, Tibetan bowls and sound, and she gave us a little taste during the show. And what was fascinating is over video, just listening to her bowls and her voice, I felt well, it won't be immediate, but a very quick change in sensation in how I felt. And I think that's the critical thing is like, oh, okay, wow. That's exactly what we're doing. Um, having practitioners provide a little taste of what they offer so that even with just that little 10 minute sound healing thing, you can say, oh, you know what? This might be uh, something that I could pursue and do again because I did feel something. Yes. And it made me feel better. That's the critical thing. Yes. <laughs> it's a lot of these things. Uh, meditation is another one that I've done. And I can't say that I am, I guess I'll say religious about it. I should be because every time I sit down to you do it and use it, I find I feel so much better. And there again, it's add it to your modalities of, of getting wellness and optimizing you know, I add all these different opportunities to them. But I just want to point out the check in with the rest of your team. And this is a great way too to find members of your team. Yes, I would agree. So it took me a while to get find the right team members, even though mm-hmm. maybe I found a modality I liked, it took me a while to find the right practitioner for me, because not all practitioners in certain modalities are the same. And not all practitioners know about other practitioners or other modalities and what might be right for you might not be right for the next person. So it's really so individual and, and dependent on what resonates with that person. Mm, Wow. That's, and I just love that. So um, give give us a little flavor of the kinds of people that you've got in the collective already. So it's just, it just launched uh, a month, a month and a half ago, something like that. And we have, we have a practitioner who does healing with laughter. We have a practitioner who does, yeah, you can literally laugh yourself healthy. It's pretty cool. Um, We do, we do somebody who does healing with lasers. So he uses specific uh, waves of laser light on injuries. And you can really like have amazing healing from say that old knee injury you have or something like that. We have um, a naturopathic doctor who does a 21 day detox and talks about why detoxing can be really helpful in your body. And we have um, a, a woman who does a allergy elimination has a take home allergy elimination kit, which uses somewhat like NAET, natural allergy elimination technique, but it's, it's an at-home kit you can do yourself. So she talks about that. Um, There are more that I'm not just thinking off (laughs) off the top of my head, but each of these practitioners has a little sample training, a little mini training inside the collective for collective members to explore and experience and learn about. Mm, uh, And the other thing I wanted to mention too, when you talked about all the recipes that were so helpful, I, I have collected all of these 
adaptable recipes into the collective. So they're available for all the collective members to go through and you can search by eggs or you can search by broccoli or whatever your ingredient is. Let's say you wanna cook with amaranth and you can find amaranth recipes that are, that are designed to be adaptable so that even if everything in that recipe is not something that's safe for you, it tells you how to substitute it. That's what I love. And I just want to take a little left hand turn here, guys. So talk to us a little bit, you know, you're also well known for your one pot meals, and and your skill in adapting recipes. Let's talk a little bit about that, because I found that helpful, too. It wasn't just getting this list of yes and no kinds of things, but actually understanding during pandemic, I thought, well, I'm so happy I learned this a couple of years ago. (laughs) I mean, guys, I knew how to cook, but I honestly, I didn't really know uh, the importance of cooking. And it was so fun that during the pandemic, when all of us were cooking at home, to have this access to um, your, especially your idea of the one pot meals. I love those. Yes. So my cookbook, I call myself an accidental inventor. I was looking after my diagnosis with multiple sclerosis, I was uh, studying and I realized that whole foods are better for you than processed foods. And so I became convinced that I should follow a whole foods based diet versus all the processed foods that I had been eating up until then, but I didn't know how to cook. And so one night I was watching a late night TV and it was in the days before we had cable TV. So we were watching an infomercial. And the guy says, look, we can make your whole meal with this one countertop appliance. And he puts in dry rice and can of tomatoes. And he puts a metal grate over it, like a barbecue grill type grate, puts chicken breasts on top of that, another metal grate and brownies on top of that, covers the whole thing with a dome, plugs it in, turns it on. And I was like, wow, that is brilliant. But I don't have that countertop appliance. I don't have any of those metal grates and I don't really care about the brownies and so <laughs> that's what I was thinking <laughs> um, tomato flavored brownies okay <laughs> yeah so I literally just went over to my oven and I thought I bet that countertop appliance gets pretty hot so I put it at 450 degrees I had a cast iron dutch oven as a wedding gift and that I hadn't used yet and I just started kind of layering food in in the same kind of idea that the guy on the tv had been doing And I put it in my oven and then about half an hour just smelled like dinner. And so that's where my cookbook, Glorious One Pot Meals, comes into play. And I actually received a patent for this cooking process. Wow. Well, congratulations. And it sure has been helpful for me in being able to use the food sensitivities that I know about, you know, and understanding that and also creating great meals. I've really enjoyed it. And the adaptability of the recipes is so helpful because when pre understanding about food sensitivities. I had some very helpful medical professionals who say, stay away from gluten, stay away from dairy. But those were so global that pretty soon you're down, as you said, I was eating few foods. It comes down to just this small (laughs) amount of foods. And for me, I, I know when I first started talking to you, it was like, this can't be healthy that I'm only eating this handful of foods. <laughs> I, you were down to like six foods in my memory or something like yeah, that. Yeah, it was minuscule. I think there were a few that every so often I felt I could sort of cheat and throw in there. But yeah, it did get down to being quite ridiculous following other, all the all the information that I was getting. Um, and I think one of the things I want to talk about is this understanding of just taking another little left hand turn here too is about knowing what's right for you and information overload. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. I I think that's critically important. What are your thoughts on as you walked yourself through your wellness journey there after your diagnosis with MS, what are your, some of your best tips that you remember going, wow, I wish I'd somebody had told me that at the beginning of my journey? That's a good question. Well, nobody told me anything at the beginning of my journey. They just said, you know, basically go sit down on your couch and wait to become disabled. And you can take one of these injectable drugs, which I did for on and off for five years until literally I would start having a seizure before the needle even came out of my body. And I'm like, you know, my body is telling me it doesn't like that. Not even to mention the three years of hives that it was causing me. I feel like what I wish I would have known at the beginning 
was how toxic the foods I was eating really are. And the fact that no one is out there safeguarding our food supply and our, the foods that we consider mainstream and are on the shelves aren't necessarily healthy for you or even non-dangerous. Yeah, I think it comes down to educating ourselves. It really does. And knowing what's right for you is, I would just want to keep coming back to that because sometimes <laughs> people are like, well, you know, this is all about an all or nothing thinking. And it, it, it's really not that way. No, I like to say, if you can be compliant 80% of the time, if you can be 80% compliant 80% of the time, then healing is going to happen. Because right now you're just or somebody who hasn't worked with me before is just randomly willy nilly becoming inflamed and they don't see any rhyme or reason. And in fact, doctors will tell you, oh, you have an autoimmune disease. Well, if you take that word apart, auto means to itself, immune, you're allergic to yourself. Evolution would say, no, that doesn't work for evolution. So that's completely nonsense. We're not, nobody is allergic to themselves. There's always a trigger. We just have to find it. And a lot of times doctors don't, aren't looking in the right places to find it. Right. And I want to say that there sometimes can be more than one trigger. So as you, Oh begin... yes, there's always more than one trigger. <laughs> I'm going to say <laughs> yeah. as you begin to mind, mind down and drill down into your wellness and optimization, you, you'll find that, Oh my goodness. Well, there's more than one trigger and mine has changed over time as well. And the idea that what might have served you then may not serve you now. And to be very open-minded about that being like, okay, well, maybe my body's trying to tell me it needs something else now that we've reached this stage in healing. Maybe, you know, that's been taken care of and now it needs some other thing going on. Absolutely. We kind of talk about upstream issues and downstream issues. So the upstream issues, if we can fix the digestion because 80% of immunity is based in your digestive tract. So if we can fix the digestion, then a lot of those downstream issues will start to resolve themselves. But that's, it's not until we remove the inflammation and address the digestion that we can even start addressing those downstream issues. So someone who's taking a million supplements for a million different reasons is probably not gaining a lot of benefit from any of them because they're probably not absorbing and assimilating even those supplements because they're still inflamed. You have to get rid of the inflammation first. Mm, Yeah. Wow. Um, We'll get need to take our final quick commercial break here. And when you come back, we're going to talk to more with Elizabeth about inflammation and all sorts of things. So we'll be right back. Your conscious lifestyle on steroids. Ohm times radio. IOM FM. Change and growth are part of natural life, and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.omtimes.com. Grab a cup of tea or a glass of wine and tune in for Inspired Conversations with publisher Linda Joy on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Linda creates sacred space for leading female luminaries, empowering authors, heart-centered female entrepreneurs, coaches, and healers. A soulful venue where guests openly share the fears and obstacles they've overcome, wisdom and lessons learned, and the personal journey that led them to the transformational work they do in the world. Inspired conversations to empower you on your path to authentic, soulful living. Research shows we apologize up to 10 times a day, and most of the time, we say sorry as a response to someone else's mistake. What if? We thanked people instead of all that unnecessary apologizing. So instead of saying, sorry, I'm rambling, you say, thank you for listening. Join us at projectforgive.com, a free non-religious resource on global forgiveness.
Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com. And we're here with Elizabeth Yarnell, and she is a natural health expert, a patented inventor, and a multi-passionate entrepreneur. And her focus is on chronic inflammation and how it influences our bodies, and dare I say, our whole lives, <laughs> and even our family's lives. And since she was diagnosed uh, in her 30s uh, with multiple sclerosis, she spent the next decades of her life managing her autoimmunity naturally. And we've been talking a lot about food and inflammation, Elizabeth. I want to make sure or explore this idea that it's not just the foods in our world that can cause inflammation. What other things have you discovered that play into keeping us inflamed, even if we start to eat in a way that diminishes inflammation? There's so many dangers and toxins out there. I did a TED Talk on this in uh, 2014, I think it was, but It's everything from the aromas that we're smelling. We forget that a scent is actually molecules. We can't see that aroma, but it's molecules. And by breathing in and smelling that that scent and that aroma, we bring those molecules into our body. And so sometimes those molecules can be toxic. I mean, think about air pollution and all of those particulates that are in all those molecules or the scent of gasoline at the gas station when you're filling up or the nail polish remover that you're using, or the dryer sheets. Oh my gosh, don't get me started on dryer sheets. Those are like the big evil thing. If you're using dryer sheets, stop right now. There are six chemical companies around the globe and they design and create in their laboratories all of the scents that are going into all of our manufactured products. So they create the scent of all sorts of anything that has an artificial aroma, is created in these chemical companies. And so let's just take, go back to those dryer sheets, those commercials. Oh, you're supposed to, oh, it smells so good. Oh, I'm going to breathe it in. And I'm going to breathe these molecules in down to the deep in my lungs. Those are all toxic molecules that you're bringing down that evolution did not prepare us to get rid of into our bodies. And those things can absolutely cause triggers. There's so many people who get migraines from aromas, maybe perfumes that they just pass by. I remember one time when I was driving my daughter's carpool to school and the kid next door got into the car and the whole car started smelling. And I'm like thinking this poor kid, everywhere he goes all day long, his clothes are just shooting these molecules up at him and enveloping him in this toxic chemical stew all day long. That's not good for you. I remember I I read a story about somebody who was saying that they their family won a contest in the 80s, I think it was, and the the contest prize was like a lifetime supply of dryer sheets. And what they received at their house was like a huge industrial spool of dryer sheets. And it was in their house and it just started permeating their whole house with all of these chemicals, fragrances from these, this spool of dryer sheets and everybody in the household got very sick. Wow. First off, like somehow this idea of a ginormous, you know, Tyrannosaurus Rex size of which a spool <laughs> came into my mind. I'm thinking not only <laughs> where would I store it? I mean, not only <laughs> horrific, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, just just the idea of that, uh, not not anything that much of anything all of a sudden showing up my house, whether it was that or something else just kind of left me with uh, trauma, <laughs> just the idea of that showing up. You know, one of the things I do know of people who, uh, I think it's called mast cell activation, but I'm not sure where just in grocery stores, they can be triggered, just, you know, just all the different scents in a grocery store type of thing. Oh, absolutely. I can't stand walking down the laundry detergent or the the cleaning aisle, cleaning detergents aisles in the grocery store. It's terrible. I am so sensitive to it. I have clients who, if somebody literally sits next to them in a movie theater, who's wearing perfume, they'll start to have a migraine. They can't handle it at all. So there are sense, we haven't even talked about things like mold, which if you live in an environment where you're exposed to black mold all the time, that too is airborne and can affect your health in many ways and, and can be kind of hard to get rid of too if, you're, if you don't change that environment, if you don't discover the mold and get away from it. 
We had a mold expert on a few months ago, and I, this is a little graphic, guys, not too graphic for kids, but it's a little graphic. He, <laughs> he said, and I was so shocked because I know of places I've been where I've seen this. He said that, you know, if you happen to leave your toilet bowl open and all of a sudden a day or two later you haven't used it and you've got this little kind of black ring in the water, you've got a mold problem. And he was, you know, some people say, well, how do I find out I have a mold problem? And I didn't even realize that. I said, well, he says, it's in the air and it's going to gather right there on the surface of that standing water. And where else do you have standing water in your house? But in a toilet bowl. Yeah. <laughs> but I was thinking, wow, that is so fascinating to me because I have been places where you see that and you're like, wow, I had no idea that was a quote unquote mold problem. Could be mold in the bottom of the coffee maker that you're using every day. That's a common place for mold to accumulate. I, I've read that about not just that, but other kitchen appliances that come in multiple bits and parts that you need, really need to be careful to take them completely bitted and parted and clean it all because mm -hmm. that's a great place for it to hide and mm -hmm. all these places where we don't think. And that's even it. He was talking about not even in environments that we would say like, you know, the tropics where of course, you know, there's a lot of humidity, et cetera, you're kind of looking for mold. But he said, no, no, that mold is very common and even in areas that don't have those sorts of climatic conditions. So it's like, goodness sakes, always something, right? <laughs> mold can be hard to find and identify. And again, there's so many things that are lower hanging fruit that we can pick up on all of these artificial fragrances, artificial flavors. I know a couple of years ago, probably shortly after you and I last talk, that's when I discovered sodas. And I was like, oh, these are great. These are sparkling waters with just a little flavor and they have no calories. And what a great thing. My kids love them. And I feel better about them than like a soda. So I started buying like, and I hadn't had any carbonated drinks in so many years, but I'm like, oh, well I can have these. And I started drinking and within not too long, within a month, I noticed that my eyelids were swollen and peeling to the point that that I had literally caused bleeding because they were itching so much. And I, I'm like, what is going on? And I'm like, what's new in my life? Crap. So I stopped a couple of days later, my eyelids were back to normal and I'm like, okay, here's the, here's the real teller. And I had the next morning, there go my eyelids again. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> it's these natural flavors that they have in, and in so many things. So you think that you're getting something natural because it says natural flavors on the label, but it's actually an FDA loophole and they can be, I have a blog post where it says what the natural flavors in a, in a strawberry milkshake are. And it's like 30 chemicals. It's a huge, huge list. And every single item that has natural flavors, they could be made differently. I listened to a podcast called How I Built This. It's an NPR podcast. And they interviewed the guys who created spin drift, which is another type of flavored seltzer. And he was saying that they started out very small and locally, and they would take real juice that they would squeeze and then add it to the soda water. And when he went to go start canning his product to expand nationally, he said he went to the bottling company and they said, okay, well, you can just go buy natural flavors from one of these natural flavor companies. And he's like, huh? And he calls up the natural flavor companies and he says, they're like, oh yeah, everybody who has a soda uses these or whatever. And he's like, well, what's in them? And they said, well, we're not going to tell you. And he's like, I can't, I can't put that in my product. You're not even going to disclose to me what's in these natural flavors. And so he created a whole new process where he could continue to use fresh squeezed juices in spin drift. So if you're looking for a flavored water, I highly recommend spin drift instead of, but watch out for those natural flavors. They'll kill you. It's amazing where they are. They're in like everything. Once you start looking for natural flavors on labels, you're like, oh, wow, that just knocked out 90% of the foods. It is amazing to me, all the loopholes in the different labels. Uh, everything from natural is not the same as organic. And <laughs> And organic doesn't always mean completely pesticide free. That may have been in an organic state, but you know, someone explaining to me who was an organic farmer, he said, but I can't control the downwind, you know, being downwind and something drifting when that guy a mile away is spraying. 
And I was just like, wow, all of the decisions we have to make nowadays. We had Dr. Nisha Winters on the show a while ago, and she was explaining <laughs> that what we call food today is nothing like what our grandparents ate. That understanding the food industry has changed so much. Right, because our grandparents didn't know these kinds of autoimmune diseases. They really weren't around. And that's a big part of it. Really, MS was first identified during or at the end of the Industrial Revolution, at like the end of the 19th century. Before that, we weren't toxifying ourselves right and left. We like to think the FDA is out there to protect us as consumers, but that's not the role of the FDA. The FDA is there to improve the agricultural commodities of the United States. So really, it has nothing to do with health safety for people. Wow. Fascinating. <laughs> I love the term that you said, toxifying ourselves. What final thoughts do you have? We just have about all oh, three or four minutes left. Well, I would love to offer your listeners a handout. It's at multiplesclerosisdiet.com. And it's the top three things I think anybody with MS or another autoimmune issue should avoid completely. So it's a way to get started down this path of cleaning up your body. So multiplesclerosisdiet.com. And then you can always find everything about me at my website at elizabethyarnell.com. But also please pay attention at my website at the bottom. You can, and I invite you to book a complimentary naturopathic health assessment with me. And we can see, are you a good candidate for what Sharon did? And to go through and to really drill down and identify your hypersensitivity triggers and be able to, I'm going to say this, Sharon, reverse age. Like I think you have, if I talked to you, we should go back and look at that interview in 2018, because you look so much <laughs> younger today than you did then. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, I do. I, I am surprised at how my original diagnosis through now, and I am like, wow. Right. And life is really about our own responsibilities over our own health. And that's my mission in life is to empower people to take back their health and reclaim it. And it's a lifetime journey. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, my friend. Good seeing you again, even if it's virtual here. See you next week. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes.